It's nice to see some very familiar faces here, and we're here to talk about a very interesting topic today. As Microsoft for Startups, our mandate has always been connecting tech startups with corporates who are looking to solve different problems across the spectrum. So I take a minute here to say we have a dream that one day startups and corporates can work together. Actually, scratch that. That record's a bit broken, so I'm going to take that back. What I will go into is we have a panel today to talk about how startups and corporates can work together. And without further ado, I would love to introduce our wonderful panelists today. We have Carolyn Carmen from Ferro. Prior to co-founding Ferro, which is a logistics startup, Carolyn is ex-Uber and Maersk, and she was actually on part of our first cohort of GrowthX, which is our accelerator program that matches startups and corporates. We have Shafika Hussein from Eti Salat. She has had extensive experience within the telecom space, 20 years if I am exactly correct, and seven of those within the Middle East. She has been extensively working with scale-ups and startups and matching them to solve corporate solutions. And she's also our corporate partner for the second cohort of GrowthX. Last but not least, I have Elodie joining us. Elodie has extensive experience in the defense and space space. Uh, prior to being with Hub71, she was at Gotham's. Thank you very much, ladies, for joining us today. We're going to go straight into some interesting questions then. Now, when we think of startups and corporates working together, I think one thing that comes on a lot of people's minds is, what would you say are the stumbling blocks or the hurdles when startups and corporates would like to work together? It'd, it'd be great to get your insights on that. Well, maybe then, uh, then I'll start. Um, so, I mean, I, I have both perspectives, right? As you mentioned, you know, I've been previously with Maersk, very big corporate as well, uh, and now sitting on the startup side. So I would say, you know, from the startup perspective, it's really dimensions you, th you should think of, right? So the one dimension is really, uh, you know, the team size and, you know, cross-functional teams that you have sitting on the corporate side versus when you sit on the startup side, it's really small teams, fast decision making, um, a lot of decision power that lays with very individual uh, roles as well. Um, so that misalignment can sometimes be uh, a little bit tricky if there's not a full understanding and clear communication around it, like who is in charge of what, how do cross-functional teams work together on the corporate side, and that then also leads to the timeline. So as a startup, I mean, startups are known for moving very fast, which is of course possible because there is less stakeholders involved and there is uh, smaller teams involved. So clearly talking about expectations in terms of, you know, what is the timeline that the corporate expects to take a decision, what are the steps in between, um, and then kind of like aligning that or at least communicating with the startup. So that could be some of the, some of the stumbling blocks. So I, I think that uh, when there's a will, there's a way, yeah? So we have at Eti Salat uh, uh, built an open innovation program. So we have built the processes, we have the tools to uh, onboard startups and help them uh, grow together with us. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today because I'm not part of that initiative. I'm mostly looking for scale-ups, so companies that are a bigger side, with a proven uh, a success. Uh, with our solutions in a similar geography. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm looking uh, uh, to bring innovation from the ecosystem because I know that uh, uh, if we want to sustain our competitive advantage, we have to, uh, to work together and collaborate with uh, all of you guys here today. So um, yeah, that's why we joined this uh, uh, program as engagement partner and have high expectations. Definitely. I, I will definitely echo what uh, Caroline was saying, you know, um, having been sitting also both sides with the corporate and also with the startup side as an investor, I think that the non-alignment, uh, especially on the decision-making cycle, is the biggest pain point. Because on one side, you know, you have a startup who has generally a very <coughs> short time to be able to get is traction and its next pilot running. And on the other side, you have huge corporates with very formal and structured, you know, decision-making process and internal processes that are not aligned at all with this kind of very agile um, decision-making way. And, uh, and in our vertical, which is uh, aerospace and space, when I was um, with GoTimes, that's definitely where we, we found a lot of difficulties. It's interesting you guys mentioned expectations and setting timelines from the get-go, which is clearly a very important theme of this topic. So 
to echo that sentiment, another question that then comes to mind is, on the startup spectrum, you obviously have the later stage players who arguably have access to more resources. They're more developed in terms of where they are in their entrepreneurial journey. But what about the early stage startups? Like, what would you say these guys can do to have more opportunities to work with corporates? Because they might not necessarily have that resource pool. So, so just before I, I comment, I'd just like to, to know a little bit more about the audience. Can I, can I ask who has worked with corporates as a startup? Uh, right, okay. And can I ask who's had a, a pleasant experience? <laughs> Not so many. <laughs> right, okay, good. All right, so I will also uh, share a story. I mean, I, I don't want to discourage you, but um, so my role, uh, I work for Etisalat Group, so I help our operating countries outside of the UAE, so namely in KSA, Egypt and Pakistan, uh, to improve their digital experience and the, the performance of their digital channels. So basically we want to sell more through our websites and applications. So I scout for innovation that can help us do that uh, faster, better. And uh, so I'm the one who uh, makes the pitch inside the company uh, to bring this innovation. Uh, and the way I do it is very simple framework. I, I asked and, uh, the, the scale-ups or startups to help me build a business case. Uh, once we are comfortable with the uh, assumptions that we have, uh, we look at uh, a success that they've had in another geography. We interview and, uh, and, uh, and, and have uh, different conversations with the reference that uh, they bring. It can be another telecom operator we're not uh, competing with, or it can be another industry. And uh, from there starts uh, the round of pitches where we have to pitch commercial teams, IT teams, uh, finance teams, I mean everybody. So it is indeed a process that's quite complex and quite lengthy. Uh, the worst example that uh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to share, but I'll do it if, it, uh, if you close the door, <laughs> is, uh, is that with one of our operating countries, I brought an innovation that make no doubt, we knew that it would help us sell more. It was successful in another geography. It was very easy to implement. So all the uh, lights were green, but it took me one year from the moment I pitched and the sea level um, uh, team said yes to the moment we actually went live. I actually had the kickoff session today. So it's a big celebration for me. <laughs> Thank you. But yes, it can be lengthy, it can be complex. <clears throat> My best advice is find the right sponsor inside the organization uh, and I'll give you more advice at the end. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, I mean, from a startup perspective as well, I think that's a very good point, right? Uh, you know, really having a sponsor and having an internal champion that helps you navigate through the system helps a lot. I mean, when we look at the, the value add that the corporation or the combination of working with a corporate brings to a startup, it's kind of like an iceberg because it's only the tip, the tip of the iceberg is the revenue element, right? Selling a contract. But it's actually everything underneath that is, you know, the, the validation that a startup gets by working with a corporate. The validation for, you know, the team. How is the team dealing with a challenge? How is the team dealing with maybe longer timelines or whatever it might be? How is the team still working on the execution and of course the last point of the validation of, of the actual product and the benefit the product brings to that right um, so being able to um, share or how would I say like upfront some of the commitment that the corporates bring and being able to share that with external parties um, you know as a startup for example with other clients for example um, that kind of could be very beneficial if you say look we're also willing to share um, you know the positive feedback with uh, other corporates for example to kind of give you a bit of a heads up or even with investors right that that adds a lot of value to kind of tackle tackle that as well um, yeah I will add also that's definitely also a kind of human resources challenges, you know, and, and human resources transformation inside the corporate. Because most of the time you have this, you know, innovation strategy, which is coming from a very uh, top-down approach, you know, launching, I don't know how many incubator or accelerator programs, you know, which are managed like something by the side, it's a bit like the CSR program, if I may do a comparison, you know, it's by the side of the company, but this culture is not infused inside the company. And you end up having, and, well, I will not share a name, but 
that's something that um, <laughs> I experienced a while ago in, in one of the, the, the corporate I used to work with, is that you create, you know, this new kind of digital cluster where you have amazing people trying new type of processes and agility and how you can um, really leverage UX and this kind of thing. And you have the rest of the corporates that on one side is not really part of this journey, you know, and just think on the kind of reaction that when it's coming to them and be integrated in their product policy that they will push back because on one side they don't understand because it's also an education journey. On the other side, you know, they are not incentivized to take risk. So why should they work with a startup, you know, which is not legit and could put at risk, you know, their, their program development? And on the other side, if I may say also, some of them are, you know, sitting at the same position for a long time inside a corporate, have this level of arrogancy where they just think that they don't need a startup, you know, because they've been doing the same thing for the last 20 years uh, in the same way and don't think that they need someone which is, you know, external. I've been trying to tackle that issue since a couple of months to provide a solution. And sorry for, I don't know if there is anyone from corporate sitting there, but I'm we, here. <laughs> no, but it hurts you're on our <laughs> side. <laughs> I'm in the middle. No, it, it hurts me to, to, to say that, but it's true that we, we do have some challenges with the skill sets, with the culture, uh, so we can have some pushback uh, within the organization. But um, I do think what really matters is the complementarity between uh, what uh, the corporate can bring in terms of uh, the customer base, uh, uh, the communication and marketing uh, powerhouse, uh, things like that, uh, and what the startup can uh, or scale up. I, I, I'm more comfortable to, talking about scale ups because it's easier as a big traditional company to work with a, um, a company that uh, has uh, already uh, a certain size and, uh, and a certain uh, financial also uh, strength. So, um, yeah, we, we, we have to find this uh, complementarity, this balance, and at the end of the day, what matters is uh, what innovation are we bringing, how do we keep customers happy together, and how does that benefit uh, everybody? So the customers, the scale-up, and, uh, and the corporate. So we look at the cost, we look at the, the revenues, we look at, uh, at the business case in detail, and usually to assess this uh, complement complementarity and this value, uh, we do proof of concepts, and uh, over a period of months, uh, we very quickly find out uh, if the value is there, uh, how to adapt the solution, and uh, what processes we as corporate need to build in order to make uh, this new uh, product services, service or solution uh, viable and easy to, to run. So uh, yeah, there are challenges, but I really hope uh, you uh, leave this session uh, full of hope and you all come to me saying, I want to work with, uh, with you because um, it, it can be a really uh, nice uh, success story as well. So yeah. Awesome. And you've been very comprehensive about what you're looking for when it comes to scale-ups or startups wanting to work with Ati Salad. But it's interesting to also get a startup opinion as well as an enabler opinion. So, Carolyn, if I may go back to you, during your time and in hindsight with Faro, how would you would you say you would change anything when it came to working with corporates, or you think something was done great, or something could have done, was done amazing? And if you could give that as an example of a rinse and repeat, so to say. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, so I think things that have been done great is, you know, we do find sponsors like like you, for example, and, and we notice that there is individuals in, in big corporates that want to help us and they help us navigate. And, you know, we've had great support on that account. Uh, what I would potentially change, you know, we come from the B2B space. Um, you know, we sell software for logistics uh, and distribution and e-commerce companies to actually bring efficiency. And one of the things we only recently changed is we started actually uh, charging for POCs. And you know, it might sound a bit like, oh, but you're a startup or scale up, you know, how can you charge for a POC? Um, we started seeing it more as a, as a different stage of customer funneling or customer segmentation. Because the reality is, if uh, there's no one that has actually you know, signed off and we're willing to really give that solution a try and charge and pay money for that POC, which we happily, obviously, if the product uh, is bought by the client, afterwards we refund, right? But like, that is the first conversation where you get to the right stakeholders to sign off on something, right? So it's a filter for us that helps us understand, do you 
you have a budget? Uh, do you know who to talk to within your organization to actually get that over the line? Versus having spent maybe a month or two months beforehand to figure out and then come to the conversation when the POC is over, it's like, yeah, sorry, we're actually in the next budget cycle. Uh, you know, we can take a look at it at next year again, right? So I think that's the thing I would have probably implemented earlier. Uh, we get better clients because of that. We get clients that are more committed. We earlier get to the stakeholders that understand, yes, I mean, we, if there is a solution, uh, there is also money involved that needs to be paid to someone selling us the solution. So that, that's uh, definitely a tip I can pass on in the B2B sector um, where, where we are operating in. Interesting. And it ties back to what you mentioned earlier about setting expectations from the get-go so everyone knows, right, so we have alignment on all these objectives rather than there being a fire, so to say, at the last minute. Okay, and Elodie, if we could also get an enabler perspective on this. Hub 71 obviously has been doing great stuff to empower startups within the region, but do you reckon they could do something more to facilitate the relationship between startups and corporates wanting to work together a bit more? Yes, definitely. So this is part, you know, of our uh, strategy on being able to support uh, market access for our startups and for our community. So the way we, I, I definitely think that ecosystem neighbor, you know, and Tech Hub as Hub 71 has the duty to really educate, you know, the broader ecosystem on how we can co-innovate. And it's not, that's something that is very important for me, you know, it's not um, uh, the small one against the big one, but it's really how we can create more value and more profit together. So at Hub71, we are currently, we launched some programs last year, like the Outliers program. So this one is a um, proof of concept challenge where we um, go and, and scout not startups, but corporates wants to have, who have you know, uh, technical challenges and they can't find the solution internally. So we tell them, okay, come on board. We will try to, to see how we can support you in collaborating with startups and we will help you also scout you know, the right uh, startup and the right technology at the right level of maturity. So that's one program. We are currently working on a couple of other uh, new programs that we will launch around value creation. This is something which is really strategic for us because if we want, you know, we need to be very honest with ourselves, meaning our, you know, innovation journey in the UAE started only a couple of years ago. So we have now uh, been able to achieve in only a couple of, um, of years, only three years, you know, and, and most of the people who are visiting us from, from more mature ecosystem are really shocked by what we've been able to achieve. And when we see STEP today, to be honest, this is just an amazing, you know, like bunch of people who are connecting and clicking because we are all passionate about the same thing. So at Hub71, we really want now, you know, to support um, the UAE innovation ecosystem for all the startup journey. So we started, of course, with our program to support startups in the community on a seed stage for the incentive program. We went at a, a bit earlier stage with Venture Studio, but now we are working around the scale-ups and see how we can uh, create, you know, um, a comprehensive value creation program where we'll be able to support our growing startups really scaling faster than expected. Awesome. And, well, if we were to bring the session full circle, it's a question we normally reserve as a summary of the session itself. <laughs> what would be the one piece of advice if you had to pick? I know Shafika talked about giving hope to the startups wanting to work with corporates, but if there was one key piece of advice that you would have to give to the audience about startups <laughs> wanting to work with corporates, just the one, what would it be? So if I may start, I would say resilience. And anyway, it's like any business, you know, you need to be resilient. When you have to work with corporate, there is no other way around to be successful. So be resilient, be smart, try also to put yourself, and that's the first piece of advice I was giving to all the companies I've been advising. It's like, try to put yourself in the shoes of the other one. Try to understand why, as you were seeking, you know, is it a budget cycle? Is it like an internal, you know, process issue? Try to understand what is the pain point on their side and see if you can fix it. If you can't fix it, be resilient and come back in six months. So I would say, I mean, I, I, you know, resilience and grit is, is the absolute must. Uh, I would think in any in any business, right? So I also can echo that for our startup working with a with a corporate. I believe what's important as well is if you can try to do a little bit of networking and desktop research before you actually pitch, right? Uh, if you understand who's the right person to talk to, or maybe you can even get an introduction. 
you can in a corporate probably cut out three, four weeks of time before, you know, just until you get to the right person. What it then also means is, you know, as a startup, your resources are quite scarce. Uh, and as soon, because every new corporate you work with is sort of a, a bet, so you want to make sure your internal resources, the product team, the tech team is available to, in case this contract comes through, you immediately, you can turn it fast, you want to leave the best impression. But if you do this, I would say, uh, side networking beforehand, you don't clock up your core resources until you really figure out when is, you know, when is it going to move, who's the right person, and that then gives you an opportunity to use these core resources for something else until the deal is matured enough where it's actually worth bringing it to the table and involving the whole team of, of your startup. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, lots of things that have been said, uh, uh, I, I, I want to echo. So, I was going to word, use the word relentless, you use resilient, but it's the same idea behind is uh, never give up, keep calling, make the, 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 the POC, if that's a POC, make it happen. Uh, the one that we launched today, uh, the uh, provider, the vendor, was, uh, I mean, uh, uh, following up with me uh, every week for, for a year, and I was admirative. He was always positive, always changing what he had to change in the business case, sending the documentations multiple times, doing multiple demos because we had people living uh, throughout uh, that cycle. So being relentless, I think, is very important. And uh, it's paying off now. It's a paid POC. We're, I, I, I am for paying for the value that uh, people are bringing. Um, then, I, I mean, finding the right sponsor is very important because it's all about people, right? It's about building the relationships and finding the people who uh, are on the same uh, maybe wavelength and have the same uh, interest with you, uh, as you, which is to, to bring innovation, change the way we do things. And then the last piece of advice is uh, very close to what uh, Caroline just mentioned is uh, uh, don't hesitate to put time in building the business case. Uh, make sure that we understand the assumptions, uh, what assumptions we have to influence, how we're going to influence this assumption. We need to find depth uh, in uh, what uh, uh, the uh, partner uh, is bringing, and we'll have lots of questions asked from different uh, part of the business, finance, IT, commercial. I'm just naming a few, so we have to have that depth uh, from the beginning of, uh, of uh, the discussions. Yeah, so this, uh, I hope it's not too much advice. No, no. not at all. <laughs> By all means, the more the merrier when it comes to advice. So the audience have heard from us, they've heard your insights. Maybe some of them might have a couple of questions they would like to put forward. Could we, does anyone want to ask any questions? I think, I think we scared them. I, th no? I think you're, you're I think, mentioning... To be the, honest, I think they are not used. I'm so pleased today to see free... You see, the mic stopped to work. Um, <laughs> I'm so pleased to see free, uh, like, alpha female with me, because that's, uh, that's really great. That's something that we are... I'm sorry, I'm doing a little bit of women empowerment here. But... Uh, <laughs> But that's also really great because I don't think that, I hope that we're not pick up because we're female, but it's really glad to see, you know, very passionate uh, corporate owners and, and startup to see how we can build this ecosystem all together, male and female. Fantastic. Um, well, I guess, it, oh, we do have a question, please. For me, the POC uh, is there to validate all these assumptions. Thank you and help build those processes, yeah? So all these discussions need to happen then. Uh, I've had instances where you have one month POC, three months, six months POCs, depending on the complexity of the solution, the way we will implement it and the way we will run it. So I think the POC is critical for both parties to build what is right to make that sustainable and profitable. Yeah, so that would be my answer. Yeah, if you ask me, I mean, if people pay for it, uh, they will also internally look to kind of make sure they get the value because someone has committed to their boss, by the way, I think this is a great idea. So sometimes that also helps in terms of comparing results because there's more interest internal from the corporate already to also make sure that they support it as much as they can and the POC doesn't drag out forever, right? And actually fits then in, into the budget cycles and, and communicate. That's, that there is no free lunch and definitely if you have someone involved to sign a PO that will help a lot you know to empower you fantastic thank you very much for your insights and your time ladies we hope the audience has taken something away from today's session and we hope to see you again shortly at some point thank you, thank you.